Today's show is sponsored by Audible. Get a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audible.com forward slash hardcore history or text the word hardcore history to 500-500 to get started today. It's hardcore history. Attention. When I was designing this hardcore history addendum format, I knew that we were going to want to do interviews. It's a good way for us to get out content quickly that's interesting and that it involves other people, other voices, people that um, you might want to know more about. And I knew that we would have authors on because there's always a lot of good people writing intriguing books because I'm reading them. I knew we would want to have experts on from time to time because, after all, it's a great use of the medium, isn't it? And I was hoping that we could get some primary source people on from time to time, participants in the events that we were talking about. In other words, you know, I'm not a historian because historians chronicle, you know, things for history and for footnotes and stuff in books. But maybe we could do a little bit of that if we were interviewing people, you know, who were participants in these sorts of events. Well, today I have somebody that is sort of the trifecta of interviews for this program because he meets all three of those specifications. He's an author. He's an expert. And he's a primary source and participant. His name is Merrill McPeak. He happens to be a four-star Air Force general. He flew with the Thunderbirds, the acrobatic team for the Air Force. He is a commander, a chief of staff in the Air Force, and did so during the first Gulf War. And he flew more than 250 combat missions in Vietnam. Imagine that for a second. He's also a noted author who's got a brand new book out to add to his catalog of books. His new book is called Roles and Missions, which goes over his time as the 14th Air Force Chief of Staff. By the way, sort of a bipartisan guy, worked for the Bob Dole Republican campaign, also supported and was in the Barack Obama administration in terms of a military capacity. He writes about his time in Vietnam in his book called Hangar Flying. He's got another one called Below the Zone, another one called the Vietnam Chapters. If you like military history and especially Air Force history, Merrill Tony McPeak is somebody whose book should be on your bookshelf. We talked to the four-star general now who was nice enough to come and talk with us. By the way, you may have recently seen him in Ken Burns' recent multi-part documentary on the Vietnam War as well. Welcome to the show, General McPeak. First of all, let's get started by suggesting, um, you know, the person we were we were contacting, your publicist or whatever, uh, was discussing the 50th year of the Tet Offensive. And when I was thinking about how to start this, I thought, you know, I grew up in that generation where we weren't uh, in the war. We were in the early 80s, middle 80s. We were the ones learning about the war in college, and the veterans would come and speak in our classes. And I remember 60 Minutes did a whole big thing on how here we were studying the lessons of Vietnam and what did we learn. And I thought, now here we are decades later, and I thought I would ask you, 50 years after the Tet Offensive, what do you think we learned? And do you think the things we learned, for example, by the 1970s or 1980s, do you think those lessons stuck? Well, uh, speaking as a professional military guy, we learned a lot in Vietnam. Uh, we learned, for instance, just as an Air Force, just as a fighter pilot, we learned we had to hit what we were aiming at. You know, we missed most of the targets. Uh, I think our average miss distance in Vietnam was like a, a hundred uh, meters. You know, and that's not good enough if you're going after a, a target like a bridge or a a rugged vehicle like a tank or a truck. So we invented precision-guided munitions, and you've seen the result of that in the years since. We learned we had to be able to operate at night, and we now are, nobody wants to fight us at night nowadays. <laughs> they don't want to fight us in the daytime either, but we we re really dominate night fighting now. We learned that we had to be invisible on radar, so we invented stealth aircraft. So. I mean, from the standpoint of the professional military, we learned a lot and we improved a lot because the war lasted so long. You know, 10-year war, all of us got to go there at least once. We all saw what needed to be fixed and we fixed it. Now, if you now ask uh, what did uh, we learn politically or socially, I think that the, by and large the lessons uh, were not learned at all, or if they were, they were forgotten. 
uh, we repeat the same mistakes, you know, uh, war after war, it seems to me. So uh, technically, we learned a lot, but big picture wise, I think we we missed the boat. You know, I'm thinking about the concept in business of like institutional memory, right? The idea is that, you know, you have you have the, uh, the the fact that the people can come and go in a large corporation, but theoretically, when new people come in, they're trained with the lessons learned by the previous generation. I'm thinking about institutional memory in the military. So if you guy, get a guy like William Westmoreland, who's a Second World War veteran, knows how to fight that kind of war, has to deal with this counterinsurgency situation in Vietnam— uh, theoretically learns what he's going to learn there, but then Westmoreland retires. The people who were right below him retire. Is 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 institutional memory in the military sphere a little like something like a bush in front of your yard that you have to keep cut back because every generation comes up, we have to relearn some of those same things? Is there, you know, when you read like uh, the Peloponnesian War and the stuff from ancient Athens, there's the hubris element. Is hubris something that, that a good punch in the nose can can teach you permanently or... Do you need to be reminded um, every now and then? I mean, I look at the dominance we have right now on the battlefield, and I worry that if we got into a major conflict right now, we don't have anyone in the institutions at the higher levels now that have fought, for example, in a real war against another first world military. Um, Would they almost have to do like the reverse of what Westmoreland had to do, where he had to learn to go from a World War II mentality to a counterinsurgency mentality? If we ever had to fight China in some islands off, you know, in the East China Sea, is that relearning a kind of warfare that Westmoreland understood, but we haven't done in so long, we don't know how to do anymore? (laughs) I'm sorry, that's a really Uh, long question. (laughs) (laughs) Dan, but it's a wonderful question because, uh, you know, you've always heard that we're... uh, practice to fight the last war. You know, <laughs> I think that's even giving too much credit. Uh, uh, look, uh, your question is, are military organizations learning organizations that can benefit through experience? I think they are. But remember, we fought Vietnam with a uh, draft E force, conscripted army. And it was only after that that uh, Nixon was really forced to abandon the draft and to create the all-volunteer force. The all-volunteer force is a different kind of army from a citizen-based army. And uh, I think it's probably true that a, a professional force can be a learning organization, whereas by and large, citizen-based uh, armies uh, are not because they're constantly taking in new guys for short term of service and they have to, you know, train them from the beginning every six months. But, but look, look, it's a good question. It's a profound question. It goes back to the Peloponnesian wars or (laughs) before that, as you say, and I'm not sure, you know, that I have a a total, totally good uh, answer to it. I know that the army coming out of Vietnam was not happy with its performance. Uh, Westmoreland, uh, Westmoreland's failures in particular, uh, and guys like Norm Schwarzkopf and Colin Powell set about rebuilding the culture of the army. Uh, and they, the army we have today, I think is considerably better than the one we had in Vietnam, which was, guilty of uh, fragging its own officers and and senior NCOs and drug abuse and uh, other forms of of indiscipline on the front lines. I don't think you see that kind of army anymore. So you'd have to say, I think that that we did learn, you know, from that experience. For me, the larger lessons, though, are the policy level lessons, the political lessons. And there, I see no evidence that we've learned very much. And there I see that this uh, ancient Greek uh, problem of hubris is uh, still around, you know, in space. 
doesn't it seem like, because you seem, and again, this may just be one person uh, um, uh, shooting an arrow and, and painting a bullseye around it afterwards, but it, it seems to me that there's always this wonderful out that people who want to do something, like, I want to invade Russia, and I'm the, I'm the Nazi Wehrmacht, and someone who comes up to me and says, well, you know, that didn't work out very well for Charles XII, didn't work out very well for Napoleon, but I want to invade Russia, so I say, yes, but they didn't have the Luftwaffe, and they didn't have the Wehrmacht, therefore those historical lessons from the past are not applicable. And I feel like there's a human tendency to do that even now. For example, to say, if our military today went and refought the Vietnam War in the 21st century, we could do that and we could win because of all this stuff we have that we didn't have back then. In other words, we can go into Afghanistan and it won't be the graveyard of empires because they didn't have smart bombs in those old days. Um, do you think that there's any validity to that way of thinking? Is that a little bit of a of a human nature sort of thing? Or is there something you can do institutionally that says, listen, this is how human beings behave, so let's insulate ourselves from that typical human tendency. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. There is a an element of uh, Shakespearean uh, tragedy to, to all this. I mean, man is a failed creature, right? And uh, so uh, you see these foibles pop up time and again. Let me, I will say this, Dan. I think the professional military, especially at the senior level, uh, are reluctant fighters. Uh, it, at least that's been my experience. Now, I, have, you know, I didn't know George Patton. But by and large, from my experience in the JCS and at senior Washington levels, there's nobody looking for a fight there. Uh, their advice uniformly has been slowed down. You know, uh, it really didn't work for Napoleon. <laughs> so so uh, it's on the civilian side. Uh, in the case of the Middle East, the uh, problems that we're having still today, the neocons, you know, the guys who had never worn a uniform. Uh, Dick Cheney, you know, had uh, seven... Uh, excuses for not going to Vietnam and that the people around him and at those levels who were anxious to go back and do Iraq again, you know, to really get Saddam Hussein this time, that wasn't military. That was, uh, those were pol political people. Uh, and so the hubris that I've seen has been wearing uh, dark blue suits, not uh, uniforms. Interestingly, I, I had met General Mattis once, and he had basically said something similar. He was very cognizant of the limitations of military power when, when I was talking to him. Um, so then let me ask you this, then. I, I, it seems to me that there's an institutional bias in this country, and it's a human thing. It's a, I don't blame anyone against, let's call it the can't-do general as opposed to the can-do general. So let's say we're talking about the 50th anniversary of Tet, and we're talking about Vietnam, and Johnson or Nixon brings in a couple of military advisors, and out of the five of them, four of them say, of course we can uh, win this war. Let me tell you how to do it. Put me in charge and I'll do it. And one guy says, no, 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 you're not going to win this. It's over. Let's figure out a way to get out of here with honor. Isn't there a natural tendency to say, listen, the can't do guy, I'm not going to go with that. I'm going to go with somebody who tells me he can get it done. And isn't there a sense in the military of, I don't want to be the guy that says we can't do this. I don't want to be thought of as the guy you know, who says this is unwinnable. Of course, you put me in charge and I'll get it done. Um, seems to me that it's, it's tough for someone to stand up in that sort of situation and say, let's not do this. We wouldn't be successful. It wouldn't be prudent. Um, does that have any, and when you're talking about the institutional failures with the people who wear suits, um, is that a problem that they're going to run into? You know, Dan, I, again, you put a very deep, uh, question to me here, but let me just say that isn't the way I have seen the problem formulated during my time in Washington. Now, I'm sure this changes as the cast of characters changes in Washington. But typically, the president doesn't ask advice of five guys and, uh, you know, four of them say, yeah, I can do it. And one says no. What the president says is, hey, we got a problem here. What are my options? So he's not looking for a yes, no answer. It's not a binary problem. What he's looking for is, you know, give me uh, half a dozen things I might do here. Tell me the pros and the cons of each thing, and let me make a decision. So uh, in that case, it's 
if you're opposed to taking a military action, you just put it in the cons. You say, here's the cons. You know, we're going to lose friends around the world. We're going to lose international standing. Uh, trade's going to dry up or whatever. You can put any con in you want, but but the, the proper approach from the military advisor standpoint is to say, okay, if you want to do this, here's how you, here are a set of options and the, and the, and the, um, and the pluses and minuses that go with them, and then it's up to you. So it's a little different formulation than the one you put. Okay, so if you're the military advisor, and you've been in a, a role of, you've been a chief of staff before, you, you've been the Air Force, uh, uh, um, four-star general here. I mean, if, if somebody comes to you, the president says, I need your advice on this, and he says something to the effect of, um, oh, God, I'm losing my train of thought, General. I'm getting old now, 52. It's just, uh, um, um, <laughs> it's a little old. I, I know, I'm getting there. Aging quickly. Um, uh, if Okay, here's what I wanted to get with that. So, so the old line about the Vietnam War was the political uh, nature of the president, for example, operating as a person who's picking tactical targets, you know, for aircraft to bomb. And yet the old yep. argument that we learned back in, in military history class for why that might have been necessary was the president's got to worry about, you know, Soviet involvement, the threats of nuclear war, you know, other things happening, including maybe funding uh, the very people you're fighting at a higher level to compensate, whereas the guys on the ground, the military leaders are worried about, OK, how do I get victory in this theater of operations? Um what is the proper balance in your mind between a president who's got to worry about the you know the grand strategy across the world and the general who's got to say, listen, if you just take your hands off of me, I'll win this theater for you. Um, how do you see the balance? If the general says, uh, you know, General McPeak, if the president says, General McPeak, help me out here. What do you tell them to do vis-a-vis -vis allowing generals to have a free hand versus a Lyndon Johnson who's maybe more worried about the Soviet Union than he is about making sure no more resupply ships get into Haiphong Harbor? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> this is a problem which is at the heart of limited warfare. Uh, if, for instance... You asked Kurt LeMay what to <laughs> do he's about representative, Vietnam. Yes. <laughs> he would say, bomb them back into the Stone Age. In fact, he did say that. And we could have won. I mean, if, if, had we nuked Hanoi, the war would have been over, right? So the war was always winnable. It was just a question of what mean, uh, how limited are the means you want to use here. So you go to the president and say, okay. I'm assuming you don't want to nu to use nuclear weapons. I mean, we have an instant case right now that's very relevant, North Korea. So if we seek to intervene in North Korea, the first question we should ask ourselves is, is this a limited war? Are the means we're going to use limited? And not just the means. Do we have a limited amount of time? You know, are you going to put a limit on the amount of money we're going to spend here? So. You have to decide all of the boundaries of the limitations you're going to put on warfare. And then that has to be bought by the president. I mean, you have to tell President Johnson, OK, if I have to worry more about the Soviet Union than I do uh, winning, in quotes, in, in South Vietnam, that's, that's fine. Just tell me that. And that means I can't mine. Hanoi Harbor and blow up some Soviet boat. Now, are you willing to live with that? So the president has to understand the, the nature of the war. It's going to be limited, and that means we may or may not win. If it's unlimited, I know we can beat North Vietnam or North Korea anytime. So the first question you have to ask are, what limitations are you going to put on me so we understand all that? Now, typically today, we don't talk in terms of limited war. We talk in terms of rules of engagement. What rules of engagement is the president or the secretary of defense or the theater commander or whatever going to impose on operations? And we, we need to be eyes wide open about that up front. Now, inside the rules of engagement, I would argue you ought to give the military guy as much flexibility as possible. I don't want the president picking targets in the basement of the White House, 
you know, because he doesn't know much about targeting. Uh, it, it, <laughs> You know, he's going to pick the wrong targets, or he's going to tell me to attack them from the wrong direction, or he's going to tell me to use the wrong munitions, or he's going to tell me to send too few airplanes or too many airplanes. Those are, those are questions that he knows very little about. And what he needs to do is impose rules of engagement, tell me what the limitations are, and leave me alone. And then as long as I operate inside the limitations, he, he should never have a you know, any kind of a quibble or complaint about how I'm, how I'm doing and what the result is as a consequence. You know, the fact is we never lost a battle in Vietnam. We just lost the war. And uh, so even, and I'm not a big fan of West Portland. I regard him as rather dumb. I mean, it's, what he did, tried to do was stupid, in my opinion. And not much, much, not much improved when he was succeeded by Abrams, although there's a big school of thought that says Abrams was a much more talented officer and we were on the right track once we got rid of Westmoreland. But in any case, you know, the, the point is that there are things that politicians are expert in and there are things that professional military are expert in. And we need to understand who, who, who does what here. When you're picking targets in the basement of the White House, you're on the wrong track and you are going to lose, in my opinion, because you got the wrong guy doing the wrong thing. Let's talk about on the right track. I think that's a key point. So when I'm watching Ken Burns' Vietnam documentary, one of the things that just screams at you, I was reminded once again of the veterans coming into the class I was in in the 1980s, it screams at you is that you don't have any real way of, of determining how you're doing at any given time. I mean, the classic way that was used was body count, but we understand that if you don't have body counts, it's even with, but how, you, how do you measure progress in a way that's helpful to the heads of the military, the political heads, and the population as a whole? And we could apply this to the situation in the Middle East, for example, right now. I mean, how do you gauge progress? And if progress isn't going the way you want, do you double down on the efforts or do you determine that maybe, I mean, are we even capable of cutting loose? Was there ever another choice in Vietnam? We act like we could have just said, uh, listen, we're losing the war, so let's get out. But you know, isn't the most difficult thing in the world to disengage from combat with an enemy, strategic level or tactical level? So I guess what I'm asking is, um, how do you gauge progress, whether or not you're winning or losing? And then do you notice, if it's not in your interest to notice that you're, for example, not winning, um, you know, can, can you get back? Because in this Vietnam War, you're looking at these people that just seem, in retrospect, they look like they know the war is over, but they can't say it. They can't prove it. They can't. They can't operate or do anything about it. They seem frozen in the conditions. So there seems to me to be a real need to be able to measure progress and then have some sort of reaction to the data you're getting. Um, can you can you suggest a way maybe we could do that in the Middle East right now? And if we decided it wasn't going well, what do you do then? <laughs> Well, well, I mean, isn't this the crux of the issue, right? Are we winning or losing? And if we're winning or losing, what do you do about it? I don't think it's going well in the Middle East, just to get quickly to the answer. But, you know, there used to be a way of judging that was pretty easy, and that is territory. Uh, you won if, if you prevailed. If you held the battlefield at the end and the other guy left, you were winning, right? So Churchill could be very worried about what was going on in North Africa because uh, Rommel pushed all the way to Alamein, you know, he was inside Egypt, right? So Cairo and the Suez Canal was threatened because the geography told Churchill that he was losing. So he replaced uh, whoever it was with uh, uh, Montgomery. Uh, it's not, so in a linear war where armies face each other, you can tell who's winning by where the front line is and what direction it's moving. Or at least that's, that's one gross approximation. You know, if you're fighting in Gettysburg, you're not in good shape. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> okay. So you got to be fighting in Chancellorsville or someplace down south. Now, it's not so easy anymore with uh, stateless actors like ISIS or uh, 
you know, uh, suicide bombers. How can you tell if you're winning? I mean, the guy doesn't have any territory to capture. He doesn't have a national treasury that you can loot. He doesn't even really have a life worth living. Otherwise, he wouldn't be in the suicide bombing business, right? He doesn't care about his own life. So in this, in this kind of war, how do you judge where you are? Uh, I don't think we have a, a ready answer to that. You know, there's, there, if we had a sort of an index of violence, you'd say, well, the violence is down. And we kind of have that. But in Afghanistan, now we have the Taliban bombing in, again inside Kabul, right? And so the number, you can plot the number of incidents on a graph and, and just say, well, there are more incidents this month than there were last month. You're not doing very well. And, and in fact, that's what I'm doing in the Middle East now, sort of subjectively. I don't, you know, I don't have a chart in my office that I keep track of this specifically, but it seems to me, I, get, I have the sense that we're not doing very well in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to come unstuck from it. This is a tar baby kind of deal where you say, gee, I wish I could figure out how to get out of here with my uh, pride and, you know, uh, reputation and shape. I don't see a way to do it. Uh, we're we're kind of stuck to the problem in the Middle East, and who knows uh, how to judge whether we're doing better or poorer than we were, uh, you know, a month ago, a year ago, five years ago. Hard to say. I'm just, you know, it's funny you say that. I wasn't expecting that answer because it leads you to the next question, which is if you can't figure out how you're doing, and if you really don't have any options, if you're totally stuck, you know, I remember being told a long time ago by my stepfather who was trying to explain to me that the wide range of presidential actions that I always assumed was possible was a myth. And that when you actually got into the office, it was really much more constrained by by what your predecessor left you, a bunch of other things like, you know, I can't fight the Vietnam War the way I want because the Soviet Union might get involved. Um, when you look at the current, let's call it the war on terror um, situation, I don't see, I mean, how do you get out of that when, I mean, you know, the old, the old equation, which is it costs these elements that we're fighting pennies on the dollar compared to what it costs for us to counter them. I mean, the long-term graphing out of that situation looks horrible. If you, you know, if I, I feel like we could be doing a documentary with Ken Burns, 150 year old Ken Burns years from now, having the same conversation about the current situation we're in in the war on terror that I just saw the other night when I was watching the Vietnam war documentary. And if that's the case, Case, you know, you get this feeling like deja vu all over again, uh, or a train wreck that you've seen before and that it's happening in slow motion, but you're finding out exactly how limited the people in the late 60s were in terms of their options. Does it feel like that to you at all, or does it seem like a... T because the context of the Cold War and all that is so different, um, how similar to you would you feel if you were a president in office in Lyndon Baines Johnson's chair versus um, Donald Trump's chair? Oh boy, don't ask me that one. <laughs> okay, we can, we can go back in administration will, if it makes it easier. I will say this, look, a, a key issue is how do you define victory? Uh, another way of saying that, or what are, what's our purpose here? What's our goal? Uh, if you tell me what our purpose is in the Middle East, I'll tell you how we're doing. You tell me how to define victory in the Middle East, and I'll tell you whether we're on the 10-yard line, the 15-yard line, the 50-yard line, where we are. But I don't recall anybody ever saying, here's our objective. You know, here's, here's how we would define victory. Uh, and if you don't have a definition of victory, then you don't know when to quit or, or when to retire or how to get out, you know? Because you can't tell, you know, we, we'd like to, I mean, George W. Bush famously went on a aircraft carrier and stood under a sign that said mission accomplished. Remember that? That was <laughs> how many years ago? So at least 15. We're still in Iraq. If our mission was accomplished when George W. Bush went on that boat and declared victory, what the heck are we still doing in Iraq? 
<laughs> well, then you get back to so, okay, we get to the same question though about I mean, okay, is this is everything we're facing now sort of a bit of blowback? I mean, did did we stir up a hornet's nest and we're still dealing with individual hornets? And it would have been better had we left, you know, the hornet in chief Saddam Hussein in charge because at least we weren't the ones who had to pick up the pieces. I mean, I guess you know what what amateur armchair historians like yours truly do, General, as you almost certainly know, is we look at these and we try to find meaning from the past, which is this 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 horrible fool's game. But 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 I mean, when you look at this, you go, I mean you almost get to a point where you say, would Saddam Hussein and the Middle East we had in 1991 be an applicable trade that a modern politician would, would trade today if they could get back to that? Yes. In fact, I would have traded at the time. I wrote op-ed pieces and made speeches against Iraq, too. It drove me out of the Republican Party. You know, I ended up uh, supporting... Uh, uh, Obama in 2008. Uh, in fact, I was the national co-chair of his uh, presidential campaign. And the the issue for me was how badly uh, that whole Iraq 2 thing had been handled, including my buddy Colin Powell going in front of the General Assembly and making outrageous claims, claims that I I thought I knew, in fact, at the time were wrong about Saddam Hussein's having weapons of mass destruction, or the other lies that were told. You know, Saddam Hussein and uh, Osama bin Laden were good buddies. Baloney. There wasn't any Al Qaeda in Iraq as long as Saddam Hussein was alive. They they hated each other, or that we would be uh, welcomed as liberators. You know, people would throw bouquets of roses as our guys going into Baghdad. Baloney, as it turned out. So I said that at the time, and, and you know, a, a trillion dollars later, and thousands of uh, lives later, we're stuck with an Iraq that is much worse than what it was when Saddam Hussein was running it. So, uh, you, know, you know, the real issue here is what are our purposes? How do we define victory? What limitations are we going to put on our use of violence to achieve these purposes? These are very deep questions, very hard questions to answer. And, uh, and, and frankly, most, most presidents need as much help as possible to get to these answers, and they need help from you know, wise and good military advisors, which I don't think they, they always get. Now, you know, we were just you were just talking a second ago about uh, Colin Powell, respected military authority, but using that authority uh, um, as part of an effort to sell the American people and the world on on a particular foreign policy move. And it occurs to me, you know, one of the things that that watching the Ken Burns Vietnam documentary really brings home is the context of what a different America it was back in the days when Vietnam was first heating up the early 1960s. Uh, I was born during the Yadrang battle. I mean, so 1965, when things are really heating up with ground troops. Um, the government at that time was assumed to be telling the truth by just about everyone. It was a black and white, good and evil world. Um, the, you know, I always uh, tell young people when I'm talking to them, I always bring up the First World War, and I talk about a generation of people that could watch uh, the, the, a unit in front of them step out of the trenches and go over the top and be machined gun within 10 yards of the trench, and then the next wave will do the same thing. And I said, we wouldn't do that today. In the same way that much of the stuff that a 1962-era American would have considered a truism um, would be met much more skeptically by a 21st century American, how much did you know the, the so-called credibility gap over several administrations in that era do you know, lasting the boy who cried wolf type damage to our government's ability to be trusted um, with statements like how the war is going or anything else? Was, did, did we sort of lose? I, uh, did we lose our innocence? I guess it's a classic phrase from my 1980s Vietnam War military history class. <laughs> yep. Well, I think in particular the Pentagon Papers represented a uh, sea change. Uh, you know, after they were published in the New York Times and later in the Washington Post, uh, Americans came to understand that a succession of administrations, both Democrat and Republican, 
had systematically lied to the American people. And I don't think that was that our country has ever been the same again. The skepticism uh, uh, which that whole episode properly aroused has been with us ever since. And I, you know, frankly, it is a loss of innocence for us. And, and if you look at, you know, our history, we were never a great power until after World War One. So our our uh, experience on the world stage was pretty limited. Uh, you know, maybe 50 years of experience as a as a real actor in international affairs. And then finally, we we woke up a bit. We we saw how that sort of thing happened. It's not that uh, governments weren't cynical before. I think the Brits were, the British government has been cynical, you know, for a long time. But Americans were truly uh, children of the frontier, uh, you know, with a, with a sort of a uh, Western uh, heritage, a frontier heritage, and. We wanted to believe that our government was telling us the truth, but we learned in the Pentagon Papers that that's not so. And ever since, we've been, I think, properly skeptical. Why do you? Th- I guess the logical question is, why do you think they lied? I mean, you you know, I think the tendency uh, would be to blame some president from the opposite political party and and, and demonize them. But as you said, this was a a multi administration effort to keep from the people who are supposed to understand what's going on so they can be informed voters from really knowing what's going on. And it started with, you know, Eisenhower even, but even to the end with Nixon and Christmas bombings that were secret. I mean, what was, I guess, was it kept secret in your mind for for military reasons or was it kept secret because the reaction of the American people to their own policies was what the government was worried about? I think it was the latter. Really, uh, the government didn't, the president didn't want to be embarrassed. Embarrassment is the worst possible, right, situation for a public figure. And so the bombing in Cambodia, for instance, was secret from the American people. It sure as hell wasn't secret from the Cambodians, <laughs> you know, or the North Vietnamese Army, which was using Cambodia for sanctuaries. They knew all about it. So secrecy, there wasn't a military necessity at all. The enemy quite understood what was going on. The, the, the secrecy was required to keep the American people in the dark. And the only, you know, the only reason for that is the government would have been embarrassed to admit what was going on. That's the worst possible reason to uh, classify a, any information is to protect, to protect yourself from embarrassment. But that's exactly what was going on. Do you think that the efforts of the media today are I, I, I want to compare them to the, the media efforts in Vietnam, which were you know, so scrutinized and yet perhaps so influential on what went on. And, and I just I'm not even sure we're talking apples and oranges here in the in the ability to compare them. But how would you compare today's media coverage of America's conflicts and that, for example, take 1967, 68, because it was very different in 62. But how would you how would you compare the media's job, how they cover with the restrictions, by the way, that we understand? I mean, they don't have the same kind of ability to show this. I mean, the combat footage that it, not to change the subject, but but the thing that rocked me in Ken Burns' documentary the most, and I have no idea how he did it, is there's segments where you'll see 35 seconds in a row of footage that looks like it was shot yesterday. High definition stuff. And, you know, for people like me who've seen a lot of that footage, I couldn't figure out if it's computer enhanced or what. But but when you're looking at what the, the media is able to show back then and the difference in the coverage today, can you compare in your mind's eye um, the pros and cons of the way we did it then and how we do it now? <clears throat> the um, media coverage in Vietnam was by and large positive, in my opinion. Uh, except for photo coverage. You know, the, the, the impact of a photograph, or today video, 
is so much more uh, uh, pervasive or influential or shocking. You know, you got a photograph of, of, of a police general in Saigon shooting a, a guy in the head or a, or a, a, a very young girl running away from a village that's been napalmed with her skin on fire. These pictures uh, convey a message in a way that written journalism or broadcast journalism cannot. And, and they were very negative. I mean, uh, Buddhist monks burn, you know, emulating themselves in the streets of Saigon. When you show that, you show it on television, it just is merciless in the, in the message it conveys. And so for my money, until Walter Cronkite uh, came on CBS News and said, hey, we're not winning, guys, <laughs> after Ted, uh, the, the coverage was pretty universally uh, supportive, the written coverage. But the photographic coverage just, un just uh, undermined everything that was being said in print. Now, today, it's, uh, the coverage is much more visual much more video oriented and photo oriented. And so the bad news hits earlier, I think, because photo, fo you know, you don't see a photograph of, of uh, ribbon cuttings as downtown Baghdad is liberated. You see these awful scenes of devastated towns uh, that we're creating in the Middle East. I mean, there's no, Getting around it, we're 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 in a large scale destructive mode there in the Middle East, and that's what people are seeing. They're not seeing any upside. You know, you can talk about upside all you want and how well we're doing and so forth, but what we are seeing is awful. The consequences of of the combat there, and so I think the the coverage today is much more pessimistic and uh, down, you know, skeptical and even perhaps uh, cynical, but because they are showing, not just telling. And from now on, I expect that's the way the coverage will be because this gen you know, younger generation is much more video oriented and, and won't read the New York Times, but watch it on, you know, on uh, Facebook. Yeah, and once upon a so, time, uh, uh, it used to be Radio Free Europe trying to bo uh, get a little teeny signal, you know, over the the Iron Curtain. Now, that if we were fighting the North Vietnamese Army, they would have a troll of people on Twitter, you know, giving their side of the story or pre or pretending to be Americans, complete with photographs, <laughs> exactly. taken with their eyes, and, may and maybe yeah. fake photographs. Yes, exactly right. Well, then let me let me ask you a little bit, of, uh, and not really changing subjects, but. I can't have a four-star general on here without mining you a little bit for some knowledge and wisdom myself. I'm looking at Syria, and I'm looking, you, you had talked about, you know, in destructive mode right now. But to a, an armchair person like me, it looks like a terribly small theater to have that many different forces operating in and us hoping to keep everything clean with no major mistakes and whatnot. Um you had talked about North Korea as well. Can you talk to me a little about those two hotspots and if there's a third one you would add to the mix of places we need to be careful right now? Well, I think Korea is the most uh, important uh, and threatening problem that we face anywhere in the world or, or have faced for a long time. I really think we're up against a uh, sort of a Cuban Missile Crisis. So it's been that long. You know, uh, since we've really been looked down the, the barrel, gun barrel. As far as Syria goes, um, it is an awfully small theater of operations, especially on the air side. We're talking about aircraft like the uh, F-22 that, that super cruise. In other words, they're supersonic. They're, they're running around the sky at 1.7, 1.8 Mach all the time. And that makes Syria a pretty small country to even do a 180, do a 180 degree turn in, you know. And the Russians are there sharing that airspace with us. Now, we've so far been able to coordinate that air activity pretty well, even though the Russians did lose a fighter to, Turkey, to a Turkish uh, ground fire. 
So, but the less, you know, the, we're running the, uh, head to head against each other in a very small airspace. And it's a tribute to the professionalism of our Air Force that we haven't already shot down a few of those guys. Uh, but that's a, that's terribly dangerous. We could be any day involved in a head to head fight with Russian aircraft and where that, you know, that, that's got the potential to go, to escalate, to go anywhere. So it's dangerous. In my opinion, it's less dangerous than the situation in North Korea, where we have apparently a crazy guy in charge of a uh, government that is that does possess nuclear weapons and is rapidly developing the capability, if it doesn't already have them, to deliver those nuclear weapons against American cities. Uh, I think that's an awful situation. I think we can't allow that to continue. I believe we must intervene and do something there. Now, what should we do? Well, I'm in favor of using all the tools, you know, in the in the toolbox. If you think diplomacy will work, by all means, let's do it. If you think we can, uh, you know, economic sanctions will work, let's impose them. If you think the Chinese can help us uh, or the Russians can help us, by all means, let's involve them. At the end of the day, I think we've tried just about everything here. Uh, nothing has worked so far because what we have to do is dismantle this nuclear capability. We can't allow, in my opinion, North Korea to continue to develop uh, nuclear uh, uh, I mean, you know, uh, threats against American American homeland property and citizens and institutions and so forth. That that has to be dismantled, and I believe it has to be dismantled relatively quickly. We don't have forever to deal with this problem, or it will get to a point where we can't deal with it. Now, I, I think we should deal with it with conventional weapons, and I rather than uh, use nuclear weapons against North Korea. And I think we still have the capability to do that to dis to help the you know them dismantle this capability. Well, we need to get with it pretty soon because, uh, you know, time's running out on us here. What if, the, to go back to some of the constraints maybe that a guy like Johnson was operating under, what if the Chinese or Putin's government tell us, no, don't do that? Well, I don't think, well, we'd know that already, first of all. But remember, the North Korean nuclear capability is a bigger threat to Beijing a bigger threat to Vladivostok than it is to Honolulu or Chicago. So uh, there's every reason to believe that they would wish to cooperate with us. If not, then so be it. You know, we, we have the means to deter China and Russia. We've shown that already. The question is, we don't, I think, know for sure or, or with great enough probability that we can deter North Korea. I mean, I've heard it argued that this guy, Kim Jong-un, is a rational person. All he wants to do is hold power. Therefore, he has something to lose. Therefore, he's deterrable. And I think that's probably right. My question is, what if it's wrong? What are the odds that he's not deterrable? Say they're, say it's only 10%. So do we want to make a, a bet, again? Uh, we want to bet Chicago or New York City that he's deterrable when the odds are 10% say that he's not deterrable? I don't think we want to take that bet. And by the way, uh, the overview ought to be here about nuclear proliferation. Where are we going to draw the line? Is it okay for Nigeria or Honduras or uh, Belize to have nuclear weapons? What is, the, what is the point at which we're going to put our foot down and say, no, we've gone far enough. You know, it's, it's enough that 10 or so countries that are acting responsibly so far have nuclear weapons, but that's enough. The world is dangerous enough, you know, without uh, Estonia having a full-up nuclear delivery capability. 
So, but in any case, we now have a case which I, I think is as clear as can be that says we, we need to stop this process here. If America possesses armed forces for any reason, it is to protect the property and the institutions and the lives of Americans against threats like North Korea, a nuclear armed North Korea. I believe we ought to draw the line and we ought to give a deadline, you know, by one January next year, either the, nu- the North Koreans are dismantling this capability under international inspection or we will help dismantle it. You know, it's funny you jumped the gun and, and, and went right to my next question, which was about nuclear nonproliferation, because I wanted to ask you, is it specifically a North Korean problem or is it, a, is it, it, it you mentioned Belize, right? Okay, Is it a Belize problem? So here's my, my question, though. This reminds me a little of like certain naval treaties between the two world wars where we're telling certain powers, listen, this is 70 plus year old technology, the, the basis for nuclear weapons, right? Um, and, and when you're telling other countries that they can never develop that capability, isn't that the equivalent of locking them into second power status permanently um, in the way that the, you know, the Japanese had to have six battleships to every 10 British battleships? I mean, is that... A, it, it seems to me the farther we get away from, from when that technology was invented, the weirder it gets to tell people, listen, you can have anything but something that was invented darn near 100 years ago. Is that, should the foreign policy of the country be that no nuclear powers that aren't currently nuclear powers should be allowed to become nuclear powers? No, the foreign policy of this government ought to be that the uh, nuclear zero that we would like to see a world without nuclear weapons. We would be much safer. I mean, our superiority in conventional warfare is so pronounced that if nuclear uh, weapons disappeared everywhere in the world, it would improve the safety and security of the American people enormously. So our policy ought to be uh, zero nuclear weapons for anybody. Now, how do we get there? I have no idea because a country like, say, Israel, which commonly is understood to possess an inventory of nuclear weapons, is not going to renounce them, uh, given its security situation, you know, in the geography that it lives. So I don't know of a practical way to get to zero. I think it ought to be our objective, and I think we ought to work on it and try to get there. And eventually, hopefully, we can get there. But That ought to be our policy objective. And in the meantime, we ought to say, uh, yes, nobody else can that doesn't have them now is going to get them, and it's going to reduce them to second-class status, and that's too bad. Going to have to live with it. But, But, you know, the world is increasingly dangerous the more people get that capability. And uh, so... uh, (laughs) It does freeze people into a sort of a formulaic uh, position like we tried to do with capital ships at one time. Remember, though, we, this is not the first time we've, we've outlawed chemical munitions, right? Sure. Worldwide, hopefully. And now, and we ought to enforce that. I mean, so we can uh, put certain limitations that we hope are universal on the kind of munitions that are available for use in hostile uh, engagements. Okay, what about a conventional situation then of, of, of a change in power? So you look at something like in Iran, in their region. Uh, all of us history nuts know that, that traditionally Iran or Persia is one of the, we'll call them the regional superpowers, right? And they wax and wane, but sometimes they dominate the region. Um, it seems like the policy sometimes is we're not going to let anyone change the power relationships that are currently in place. Is that a viable 
it seems to me a hegemonic power sort of way of looking at it, but is that a viable way to look at something like the Middle East and say, no, you're not going to expand your um, influence into Syria, even if that's a traditional Persian area of expansion? Do you see where I'm going with this? I mean, how much can we, uh, we'll call it the United States as the tip of the spear, but we all represent a bunch of major powers. How much can we be the Congress of Vienna, but constantly, you know, making sure that things stay stable. We'll call them stable for lack of a better word. So nuclear stability, you're all for. What about even like regional power shifting stability? Uh, We are no doubt a status quo power because we're the top dog, right? (laughs) So we don't want that to change. And hopefully, I, I hope it never changes. I mean, if this country lasts a thousand years and we all pray it will, we, we want to be at the top of the heap for that whole period of time. Uh, <clears throat> however, you can't stand at the beach's edge and, and order the tide not to get your feet wet, you know? So change is inevitable. And uh, what we have to do is to find uh, constructive ways to allow change to occur that doesn't threaten our position. And there's every reason, by the way, that we ought to be able to do that. I mean, uh, (laughs) certainly the technical change that we see in the last couple of decades has been led by us. We've created the instability on the, you know, technological uh, front. So it serves our purposes to be in the vanguard of change where it's positive. We just have to figure out When's it positive? When's it negative? Now, in the case of Iran, I think it's been a long time since Darius the Great, so I don't know how much <laughs> Persian influence uh, as, uh, you know, Syria recently has certainly been, in, I mean, the Ottoman Empire was not Persia. No. Syria was a was a Ottoman province. It was hacked up by uh, uh, Sykes-Picot, Sykes yeah. yeah. <laughs> at the end of World War One. And, and by the way, Lebanon was created uh, separately. I mean, Syria considers Lebanon a, a Syrian province. Yeah, the so, Christian-French enclave, yeah. right. <laughs> exactly. So, so uh, this, this, the question you ask requires sophistication in the answering. It, it, it required sophistication in the asking. But uh, so, so statesmen, are judged by their ability to recognize what change is coming anyway and running around and getting in front of it, right? That's how we define statesmanship. And cheap politicians are defined as people who don't understand, don't understand precisely that problem. I've sat here and and mined you for wisdom on current affairs and wisdom on the Vietnam War. At no point did I ask you about the drama, though, of flying hundreds of missions into that situation and and what I would assume was a a, a more tense situation as as uh, anti air defenses got stronger and stronger. This is the understated question of all time. But can you describe to me just for a second? What the heck? I mean, when you look back on it, I did things that were nothing like what you did. And I think, God, I was crazy. And do you ever look back on that and just think to yourself, was that a different person or is it like yesterday for you? Do you miss it? Yeah, I miss it. Combat is uh, invigorating. I loved it. Uh, Partly because of hubris. I mean, I was arrogant. Still am, uh, probably. I mean, (laughs) <laughs> my friends, my friends might say I was arrogant, but I, when I get up strapped into an airplane, I don't think anybody can beat me. So uh, I never was. Uh, uh, for me, it wasn't a matter of bravery or courage to go out there because I, I knew I was going to kick the crap out of the other guy rather than the, the reverse. So for me, combat. I flew 285 combat sorties and. Uh, I loved every every minute of it, uh, and I miss it. I mean, it's really, really fun. Uh, it's hard to explain. I mean, I I am a, a professional warrior, you know, so that's that's what I was cut out to do, and I enjoyed it a lot. 
And I'm going to recommend that people read your books to get a really uh, a more detailed uh, uh, version of everything we were just talking about. General, uh, did I did I ask everything you would like to talk about? Is there anything that you'd like to bring up that I left out? <laughs> no, this has been a pretty wide ranging conversation and more philosophical than than uh, I'm uh, equipped to deal with. You ask your questions are are too good. I mean. Nobody has, including Herodotus, uh, you spoke of the Peloponnesian Wars, nobody has answers to these questions. And, and they're not, it's not good to ask a professional uh, military guy. You gotta, these are questions for the philosophy professor, not for me. But, but cer- certainly it's been as wide ranging as, as I could desire and, and, and more so than I'm really uh, any good at uh, handling. General, you underappreciate yourself. I tailored those questions after watching you talk, and I think you're absolutely... And you know what's funny is when I met General Mattis, I thought that's how he thought, too. Uh, You're very well-versed and wide-ranging yourself. Well, I appreciate it, Dan. Thanks very much. I enjoyed talking to you, buddy. My thanks to General McPeak for coming on the program and putting up with my traditionally unusual and long-winded questions. His books are available everywhere. We will link to some of them on our website. His latest, as I said, is Roles and Missions, cataloging his time as the 14th Chief of Staff of the Air Force. He's a fascinating guy, I think you can agree, and I appreciate him coming on the program. I am a true believer in the idea that reading makes you a more formidable version of you. And it's hard to read these days, isn't it, to find time to devote to simply looking at a page for hours. It's wonderful. I I love it, but it's hard to do, isn't it, in this busy world? A lot of people like to combine things they have to do with things they'd like to do. Got to drive somewhere in traffic? Why not make yourself a more formidable version of you and enjoy a good book while you're doing it? Of course, you got to keep your hands on the wheel. You got to keep your eyes on the road. So let's make it an audio book. And if you're going to do that, let's get it from Audible, the long running sponsors of this program who help make it possible for you to educate yourself, entertain yourself, and read while you do something else. It would be hard to find anyone who's made it easier, figured out more angles and things that you would like as part of the process. I mean, you sign up for Audible, you get a free 30-day trial membership, you'll get a free audiobook. You sign up for good, that they just keep coming. And Audible's figured out a way to do this better than anyone else. I mean, take, for example, their whisper sync for voice aspect to this whole thing, where you can switch back and forth between reading text and listening to the audiobook across a whole bunch of devices. I mean, you're reading on your Kindle, and then you have to leave, so you go into your car, you listen in there, you get out of your car, your Amazon Echo plays it right from where you left off. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Don't miss a word. You can share a book from your library with anyone if it's their first time accepting a book, and they can listen to it for free. And you own your books. This is key to me. I don't want to buy something and then not own it. With Audible, you own the books that you purchase through them. Now, what book should you purchase? Well, of course, whatever you think is going to make a more formidable you. But for me, I am just addicted to reading the accounts of participants in things like the extremes of the human experience. I mean, take, for example, uh, Tony McPeak, who we just had on, the four-star general. Love that stuff. But if Vietnam is not your thing or you're more of a land war person, well, how about War as I Knew It by General George S. Patton? probably the most famous, arguably the most famous Second World War U.S. general. This book is a little different because it is his remembrances and stuff out of his diary, but he died before the actual work that he was going to put together came out. But it's about as close as you can get. The narrator even sounds a little patentish. I mean, if you want the definitive account that exists from General George S. Patton's own you know, written words, Go get War As I Knew It. If you're a military history person, it should be on your bookshelf anyway. If you are a person who does a lot of driving, who can listen to books while they work, well, then maybe you need the Audible version too. War As I Knew It by General George S. Patton. Go pick that up at Audible and go to audible.com forward slash hardcore history and, you know, basically, virtually, digitally, tell them I sent you. You can also text all one word, hardcore history, to 500-500. 
and get started with your free audiobook today. The policy here is to let you hear the shows and then decide for yourself what they're worth. We sort of rely on the honor system as our business model, and so far, so good. Thanks for all your support. It keeps the lights on around here. Go to dancarlin.com for information on how to donate to the show.